Today I'm going to show you how to make a game like Squid Game on Roblox. If you didn't know, Squid Game is an insanely popular Netflix show at the minute and loads of similar games are appearing on Roblox. So we're going to be making the red light, green light game in this episode. Now if you want to get the finished project with all included scripts instead of having to write out the code and watch the entire tutorial, you can get them by becoming a premium member of my channel. So you all you need to do is click the join button below the video or if you're on mobile there'll be a link in the description. Now I'm also going to be giving you the map and the characters as a kit. Now I decided to instead of use the original Squid Game doll, I've decided to use something a bit better than that. Well in my opinion anyway, I'm using a bacon hair. But if you want to use your own Squid Game doll, don't worry. In the Roblox toolbox, there are plenty here for you to choose from. All you need to do is configure them, just as I'll show you in the tutorial. Right, let's get into it. Right then, if you've never made a Roblox game before, we're going to be using Roblox Studio. This is what all Roblox players use to create games. Now, if you haven't got it, don't worry, I'm going to leave a link to the description. You should be able to go to roblox.com forward slash create, be able to click a download button from there, just install it into your computer, and once you load it up, it'll ask you to log into your Roblox account, go ahead and do that, and you should see this screen. Now, we're going to go ahead and click base plate. Once you've done that, you should see a base plate like this. Now what we need to do is we need to go ahead and get that kit. So go to the link in the description where it says the Squid Game kit and then go and click get. Okay, so you should see this. Click on get and get now. And now this is in our inventory. So let's go back to Roblox Studio. Okay, now back in Roblox Studio, let's click on the home tab and select toolbox. Now, if we click on these four squares and then select my models, you'll see the Alvin Blocks Squid Game Kit. So go ahead and click on that and it will insert it into the game. Now let's close the toolbox. Okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select the Squid Game Kit in the Explorer and I'm just gonna move my camera up to find it. Alternatively, you can just press F on the keyboard. So now we've got our kit. What we need to do is we need to put everything that's in the kit in the right location. So I'm going to right click on the Squid Game Kit and I'm going to click on Ungroup. Okay, now we've got four different objects which have appeared. We've got a thumbnail camera and this is just nothing to do with the game so we're going to delete that. So right click, delete. The next thing is saying Ungroup in the workspace. So it's already in the workspace so we're just going to right click on it and select Ungroup. This is our map. Then I'm going to take the second model, which says ungroup in server script service, drag it into the server script service, right click and ungroup. This is our ragdoll script so that when a player dies, they'll just fall flat into the ground. And next we're going to drag the third one into the starter GUI, then right click and ungroup. Now you'll see two GUIs. One is for our squid game to say red light or green light. And this one is just a warning for anybody who is using the kit but isn't watching the video. So you can just select the warning GUI. Make sure you select warning and not the client. Select this one here, right click and delete. All right, we're ready to start coding. Okay, so I'm gonna show you how to set up a custom character. Now we've got a doll here, but I said I was going to be using my bacon hair. And if you're using the kit, you will see a bacon hair, not this doll. So if you wanna get your own doll, Go to the toolbox, click on this little shopping basket and select and type in squid game doll. Okay. And then you can take one for your own. Okay. I think this one should be perfect. And what you want is you want to have a model called doll and you want to have it with a body and a head. Okay. You just want to have a body part and a head part. You can have multiple parts. Just make sure you've got a head part in here and one called body and then put it in a model and make sure it is called doll. So I'm going to remove the doll because I'm going to be using my own bacon hair because I want mine to be more original, still with that squid game theme to it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to search for a bacon hair. Okay, bacon hair. There we go. I'm going to insert it into the game. Now I'm going to name this model doll. Okay. And I'm going to then inside the model, 
what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get rid of any of these scripts because we don't need these scripts. And I'm just going to do a quick check to make sure there's no viruses in this model. It looks good to me. There's no scripts or anything. We don't need to have scripts in this NPC. So delete any scripts. And then I'm going to click on the humanoid and I'm going to select display distance type in the properties tab. If you don't see these two windows, by the way, click on view and click on explorer and properties. I'm going to select the humanoid display distance type and set it to none. That removes the name above the head. Then I'm going to take the, uh, where is it? Where is it? We're going to go to the head. No, nope. we're going to go to the humanoid, sorry. And we're going to insert, or actually we can scrap that. We can just take our doll and we can resize it like this and hold down shift and it will just resize. Okay. So now we've got a large bacon hair character. I'm going to move it over here and I'm going to rotate it like this. Okay, cool. So we've got our bacon hair and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make sure we've got the head and that is the main part. We just need a head so that we can turn it around. So now that we've got our doll, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up our script, uh, but I'm going to take this doll and I'm going to put it in the map. Okay, so inside of our map, we should now have a doll and inside that doll, we should have a head part. I'm going to select all of these body parts here and I'm going to set the anchored property to be true. This is just so that the bacon hair doesn't fall apart when we play the game. So if we play it, you can see our bacon hair here. Uh, the head, uh, the hair has fallen in. Let's try and work that one out. Okay, I'm just going to move. I'm going to go into the power hair. I'm going to select the handle and I'm going to make sure that is anchored as well. Okay, so let's try it once more. Click on run. And now our bacon hair is perfect. Right, let's get coding then. What I'm going to do is I'm going to close the map for now. I'm going to insert a script into the server script service. I'm going to call this script uh, server. Okay, but you can call it whatever you want. This is just a server script that's going to handle everything to do with the game. So firstly, let's define a couple of services that we're going to need. We're going to need to get the tween service. So we're going to say local tween service equals game colon get service tween service like this okay and what this will do is it will allow us to move parts such as the player's head the uh, the doll's head next we're going to get the player's service so this has some handy functions which we can use to get players in the game we'll need this for when we are getting our contestants when the game starts so local players equals game colon get service players like this and don't forget, you can pause the video at any time to copy out the code if I'm going a little bit too fast. OK, you can also turn the speed down as well. So next, I'm going to get the map and we're storing these things as variables so we can quickly access them later on. So local map equals game dot workspace dot map. Then we're going to get our doll local doll equals map dot doll. And then we're going to get our uh, UI for the timer. You can see in the map here that we have a timer and if we go into the map and we go to our timer part here, it's got a surface GUI that lets us put text on a brick and inside of it, it's got a time label and you can actually change that to have any text you like. So I'm just going to keep it at three minutes for now, but um, we will code this in our server script. So let's say local timer UI equals and since it's inside the map, we can say map.timer.ui. Okay, next, let's create a variable to store uh, the amount of seconds that our game round will be. So I'm going to say local round underscore duration underscore seconds. Okay, this is just the way that we write our variables. It's like the common practice of writing a variable. Uh, you don't have to have underscores. It's up to you, but I just prefer to. So I'm going to set this to 60 seconds. So this is going to be one minute. And by the way, these two hyphens indicate a comment. So it's like you can add your own notes so you don't forget things. So I'm just noting down that that's one minute and you can change this to however many seconds you like. It's just going to increase the length of the round. Next, we're going to create a tween and this tween is going to spin the head. So what we can do is we can say local spin tween info and this is just setting up the information for the tween. So we're telling it how long is it going to take to spin the head? Is there going to be a specific 
uh, animation style, like an easing style. So we're going to say tween info dot new. And you can see we've got the time on the screen first. So we put the time in seconds. So one second, the easing style. So that's like the, 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 the kind of animation. So will it be bouncy? Will it be a linear style? Uh, you'll see later on if you change them and you swap out the easing styles, you'll see how the head turn might be a little bit different. So we're just going to say enum.easingStyle.linear. Then we're going to do a, co a comma and we're going to say enum.easingDirection.inOut. Again, this is just telling the script the style of the animation. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to add a closing bracket here. Okay. So now that we've done that, what we need to do is we also need to um, we need to create two tweens using this information. So one for when it uh, it it goes, so the head goes to face the character, so it turns like this, Ooh. and then when it turns back like this, Ooh. okay, All right, you get it. So we're going to need two tweens, one for when there's a red light. So when it's red, it's going to go this way. When it's green, it's going to go back to facing the wall. So let's set up our green light tween so we can say local green light head equals tween service colon create and in here we firstly need to say the object that's going to be tweened so the object that's going to be animated and that's going to be the doll's head so this is why it's important to have a part in your doll called head now i am going to leave the two dolls in there the bacon hair or the uh, squid game one so you can choose but just make sure it's called doll and it has a part in there that is anchored called head. So we're going to say doll dot head. Whoops, like this. Then we're going to do a comma and we're going to pass our spin tween info to this function. So it's just telling us how the tween is going to, what it's going to be like, what it's going, how it's going to be animated. And then finally, we need to tell the script what things we want to change during the animation. So we want to rotate the head. So I'm going to put a table here, which is a pair of squiggly brackets. And then inside of here, we're just going to say that we want the C frame. We want to change the C frame. So that is the position and the orientation of the head. And we need to set this to a new C frame. So let's create two variables. Uh, in fact, let's create one variable because we only need one for the original head position. So the original head C frame is going to be the doll.head.c frame. So the current position and rotation of the head, which is facing the wall. So we can say C frame equals our original head C frame like that. And that is our tween created. Now let's do the same thing, but for the red light tween. So we can take this code here, these three lines, we're going to copy and paste them, control C, control V or command C, command V if you're on a Mac. And we're going to say red light head equals tween service colon create. We're going to keep these two things the same, but we're going to change our C frame. We want the C frame to be rotated the other way. We need to rotate it by 180 degrees. So to do this, we can take the original head C frame and then multiply it by C frame dot angles. Okay. And then we're going to put in three zeros, zero comma zero comma zero, but we're going to change the middle zero from zero to math dot rad and then in brackets we're going to put 180 so what this is doing is it's rotating it by 180 degrees but we don't give the rotations in degrees here we have to give them in radians which is a different type of uh, of angle of measuring angles so we convert it from degrees into radians by saying math dot rad and putting the 180 degrees in here so this is going to do a 180 degrees rotation okay so now that we've created our two tweens, we'll be able to move the head of the doll. Okay, now let's make the function for the round um, logic, which is going to repeat over and over again. So we're going to create a function and let's call it start game. Okay, and then let's just create a while loop at the bottom here. This is going to be our main game loop. So a while loop just runs forever. That's what lets you have a round system because it's just going to keep on going over and over and over until the server shuts down, until no one's uh, in the game anymore. So we can say while true do. 
Now this is really important. We need to add a wait in here to make sure that this doesn't run uh, uh, it doesn't run basically without a delay. Otherwise it will crash our computer. So we're going to say task dot wait and inside these brackets we're going to put 10. So there's going to be a 10 second interval in between each round. And then we can just say start game after those 10 seconds. And that's going to call this function. And then inside that function, we can put all of our code to run the game, to, t you know, to, um, to set up all of the players and put them into the round to, um, to, to make the tween for the head play. So we can have our green light, red light changing. We're going to do that in this function here. Right then, so what we're going to do first is we are going to create some variables for the game. So we're going to need to get all of the players that are going to compete in this round. To do this, we can say local players in round equals players colon get players. This will return a table of all of the players currently in the game. <laughs> okay, uh, we're also going to create a table to hold the winners. So these are the ones that will get to the end of the course over here get to the safe zone pretty much and when they do get to that safe zone they are going to touch a part an invisible part that's here called the end barrier so we will put them into this table when they touch that then we're going to have a spin delay so this is going to be uh, the delay in between the head moving so the time that you get to move before the next red light and we will make this decrease over time so maybe the first time you have five seconds the second time you have four three, two, one, etc. So it's always decreasing. So you never know when the head is going to turn next. And then we will just create a variable for the last spin. And we're going to set this to tick. Okay. Now you might be wondering, what is this? But tick is just a number of seconds since January the 1st, 1970. So you can compare those ticks. So if I took a tick now and took a tick in 10 seconds, the second tick would be 10 more than the first. So you can subtract them to work out the amount of time since the last head spin. So we can work out how long it's been since the head last turned. And then finally, um, what we're going to do is we're going to dress all of the players. So to do this, we're going to say for underscore comma player in pairs. I'm going to say players in round. So we're looping through all the players in the game that are playing. We are going to respawn them. So we're going to say player colon load character like that. And then we need to actually put the character's suit on them. So how do we do this? Well, let's create a function above this called dress character in suit. And we're going to have a parameter and the parameter is going to be the player's character. And we will pass this to the function. So let's just call dress character in suit, and we can pass player dot character up here. So what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of their existing clothes. So we can say for underscore comma and let's say object in pairs character colon get children and have a closing bracket here. Do we're going to say if object colon is a shirt, okay, or object is a pants, or object is a shirt graphic, then we're going to say object colon destroy. So any of these objects we want to remove from the character. And then we're going to add their tracksuit. So to do this, we can say local shirt equals instance dot new shirt we'll say shirt dot shirt template equals and then we're going to put a string using quote marks or speech marks and I'm going to paste in the asset ID for these uh, shirts I'll leave it in the description for you and we're going to say shirt dot parent equals character and then we're going to do the same thing. We're going to copy these three lines with control C or command C and then press uh, control V or command V. And we're going to change shirt to pants. So anywhere where we see sh shirt, we're going to put pants. So we're just going to replace it here and here. And where it says shirt template, we'll put pants template. Then we're going to re replace this asset ID again with 
the pants. So we're going to just go here, we're going to right click or just press control V like that. Okay. So like I said, shirt and pants will be in the description. Okay. So now that we've put the pants and the shirt on the character, let's go ahead and test that it works. Now I'm going to just change this task dot wait to five seconds. So we don't have to wait as long. And now let's click on play in the scripts menu tab, click on play. And let's see, let's see how this is going to work. So we're going to wait the five seconds and there we go. Our shirt and pants were placed on our character. Now, if it's not working for you, click on view, click on output, and it should log any error messages there, which should indicate that you've probably made a typo or done something wrong. Okay, let's move on. So the next thing that we're going to do here is we're going to set up the invisible barrier here for when you get to the end. So I'm going to create a variable because we have to set up a connection and a connection is a link to a event. Uh, an event is something that is checking for an action. So in this case, we want to check when something touches that end barrier and we only want to check it for a limited amount of time whilst the game is running. So we're going to store that event connection as a variable. So once we're finished, we can disconnect it and that will reduce lag. So let's create a variable called end touch. I'm going to put this variable up here with my other ones just so that we can be consistent here. And then I'm going to say end touch equals map dot end barrier. So make sure if you're making your own map, you've got a part called end barrier and it covers the entire span of the map towards the end of that. So map dot end barrier dot touched colon connect. And if you're using my kit, don't worry, we've got these parts already created. Connect function and then a pair of brackets after that and then drop a line and you should get this end with a closing bracket here. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a argument here for the object that touched the barrier. So I'm going to call it toucher. OK, so this is the object that will touch the barrier. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that the toucher is actually there, that, that something actually did touch the brick and it's not been deleted and it's actually got a parent. So let's say if not toucher or not toucher dot parent, then return end. OK, and then outside of that if statement, we now know that anything that's touching it is live and in the game. So let's get the character of the thing that touched it. OK, so we can say local touch character or let's say touch car equals toucher dot parent, because if it's a body part of a player, then it's going to be inside their character because all body parts are stored inside a character model. So we can say toucher dot parent to get their character. So now we can say we can get their player. So we can say local touch player equals players colon get player from character. This will get their actual player object from their character. So we can put touch car inside of here. And if it is a player, which we've just verified using this function, it will return a true or false value. True if it is a player. So we can say if touch player, then we want to put the player into the winners table because they've finished the course. So we will say table dot insert. We want to put them in the winners table. So we'll write that first. That's our list. Then comma. And then we want to put touch player in there. OK, so now that we've put them into the winners table, we want to take them out of the players in round because they finished the round. So let's try and find them in that table. So we'll say local player index equals table dot find. And inside of here, we can put players in round. Sorry, let's do players in round. This will look up the player in that table. So we're going to put touch player. So if it can find it, then we can say if player index, then table dot remove and we can remove them from the players in round table. We want to remove the player index because the player index is their position in the table. So if it does find my player in the table, let's say perhaps it's the third object in the table. We're saying, OK, let's remove the third index from players in round and that will remove me from the table. 
And then what we need to do is I'm just going to remove this white space here because we're now finished with the touch barrier. That will make us a winner. Um, you could do other things in this um, part of the script, such as giving a player some sparkles if they win, for example, or I don't know, um, whatever. But we've got them in the winners table. So later on, we could give them cash or something, etc. But now I want to move on to the actual game loop and incrementing the timer, etc. So I'm going to create a simple for loop, which counts down from the number of seconds for the round all the way down to zero. So I can say for I equals round underscore duration underscore seconds, comma zero, comma minus one. Do end. This is going to count down from 60 seconds, which is our variable, down to zero. And it's going to go at a rate of minus one each time. So it's counting down by minus one. Now, what we're going to do is every time this for loop uh, runs, sorry, it's going to loop 60 times, basically. So down from 60 to zero. So any code that's inside of it will run 60 times. So every time it loops, we can change the timer's uh, UI. It, you can change its text labels text. So timer UI dot time label dot text equals but we need to change the seconds to an actual time, okay? So for example, it will go 60, 59, 58, 57, but we want it to be like a timestamp. So let's create a function and I'm gonna call it seconds to timestamp. And we're gonna take the seconds as a parameter here. I'm gonna drop a line. And inside of here, what we're going to do is we are going to uh, just do a check to make sure that there's no negative seconds or it doesn't go into overtime. We only want it to make sure that it's... So I'll give you an example. If for some reason the timer went down to zero, minus one, minus two, we don't want that, okay? So we can just say seconds equals math.max seconds comma zero and then it will make sure that if seconds does go underneath zero then it will just default it to zero okay and we want to get the number of minutes so we want to convert this into minutes and seconds so let's say local minutes equals math dot floor and then in brackets we can say seconds divided by 60 and this will give us the number of minutes and it will round it down as well so it's not going to be a decimal and then we need to make that a string because we're going to concatenate it in a minute with some text. And you can't have two data types that are different. It has to be either a string or a number. So let's convert that into a string here. And then we're going to get the amount of leftover seconds because, like I said, we're rounding it down, but we're also losing some seconds there that are left over. So it might be one minute and 41 seconds. We need to get those leftover seconds back. So local leftover seconds equals two string. And inside of here, we can say seconds mod 60. And that will give us the remainder, the remainder amount of seconds left. And then what we can do is do a quick check just to make sure that if the amount of leftover seconds is one, we need to add that extra zero on. Otherwise, it would just have, it would only have one zero. We need two zeros there. Actually, that's on my bad on, on my part. What I mean is, say we get to 10 seconds, right? You've got two uh, numbers, right? As part of, of you, you've got a one and a zero, okay? But if you go to nine, you just have one number, okay? So it would say, it would be like this. It would go from like 10, zero, zero, but then it would go to like 959. We don't want that. We want it to be 0959. So we're compensating for that extra leading zero. So we're going to say, if hashtag, Leftover seconds equals equals one. So the number of numbers in that leftover second, if it's just one, then we want to change the leftover seconds to be what it is currently, leftover seconds. But we want to have a extra zero at the start here. And then we can have dot dot leftover seconds. So that will add a, a, a zero on so that we can then return the minutes uh, let's okay, let's do two string minutes dot dot and then we can have a colon in between and we can have our leftover seconds here. Okay, so this will just make sure 
that if it goes to 10 seconds and then it goes down to 9 and 8, it will have that extra zero on, on the end here. Okay, so now that we've converted our seconds into a timestamp, we can then scroll back down here and we can call that function. So let's say seconds to timestamp. And let's put i in there because i is the number that will be counting down. It will be that, that number. So we're taking those seconds and converting it into a timestamp. Okay, the next thing we need to do is we need to make sure we need to do a check to see if it's a red light. So every time that this loops, every second, we're going to check and we're going to say, okay, have we got a red light? And if we've got a red light, we want to get the positions of the players and check them to make sure that they haven't moved. So to do this, we firstly need to store whether it's a red light or not. So I'm going to go into the replicated storage and I'm going to create a ball value. I'm going to call this ball value is red light. Okay. And we can update this when the light changes. And then in this for loop, we will be able to check that and we'll say, okay, is it a red light? If it is, let's get the player's positions. Let's then store that position and let's check to see if they've moved by a stud. Okay. And if they have moved by a stud, let's kill them. So for now, let's just do a quick if statement here called if is red light. In fact, we need to make a variable. Let's make a variable to store our red light here. So at the top of our script, we're going to say local is red light equals replicated storage. Let's create a variable for replicated storage here. Local, hold on. Local replicated storage equals game colon get service replicated storage. Okay. Now we can say replicated storage dot is red light, just like that. And now if we go back down here, we can say if is red light dot value equals equals, well, you could just say if it is red light dot value, that will check if it is true. So if there is a red light, then we're just going to add a comment so we can come back to this later. Let's store the positions of players and check if players have moved. Okay. So what we will do is we will store the players positions when this changes and we haven't done that yet. We haven't, we haven't written the code to change the red light, but when we do that, we will store the positions of the players. So we will get the position positions of players. Okay. And then we will check if the players have moved. So what we'll do is before that, let's do the actual code that's going to make the red light change. So I said earlier how we are going to see when the last spin was, when the tick happened. So we're going to compare ticks. So ticks is just the amount of seconds uh, since a specific point in time, and we can use it to work out how much time has, has gone by. So we are going to check every single second to make sure that the delay has been passed, the delay of five seconds. And if that has been passed and we have waited five seconds, we're going to change the red light value. So outside of this if statement, we're going to say if tick, so the current amount of seconds, so since January the 1st, 1970, take away last spin. So this now becomes the amount of seconds since the last spin, since the last head turn, since the last red light. So we want to say if that time is greater than or equal to the spin delay. So this is essentially the same thing as saying has five seconds gone by since the last turn. And if it has, then let's set the is red light value to the opposite of what it currently is. So if is red light dot value, so if it is true, then we want to make it a green light. Otherwise, it's obviously got to be false. So let's make it a red light. Okay, so let's just do the green light part first. We will say uh, is red light dot value equals false. And we can make the head turn. So we can say green light head, which is our tween we just made up here at the start. We're going to play that tween. And then 
we can do the same for our red light tween. So we'll say is red light dot value equals true. And we will say red light head colon play. And now what we want to do is we want to wait until the head has finished turning before we log the player's positions. So the way it's going to work is let me show you an example here with an NPC. Let me just get an NPC up here. Here we go. So let's say this is our NPC, right? And when there is a red light, we're going to store that position, right? And then what we'll do is maybe they'll move. If, say they move, for example, when there's a red light, they shouldn't be doing that. So we stored their position as being here, but then we've noticed that they've moved. Well, we're going to say, okay, well, we've got this stored position of when the red light came into effect, and this is where they've moved to. So let's compare the, the distance between these two players. And we might work out that they've moved five studs. And we will only allow them a minimum of one stud movement before they die. So we'll notice that five studs is greater than one, and we will kill them. Okay? So let's go back to our server script. And in here, what we're going to do is we're going to create a function, another function at the top here. So let's create a function, and I'm going to call it log player positions. And we're going to take a parameter of the players that are in the round. So log player positions. I'm going to get a parameter. I'm going to call it players. Drop a line. Make sure this end is added in here. And what we want to do is we want to loop through every single player that's in this players table. So we're going to pass that that players in round table to this function. We're going to say for underscore comma player in pairs players do. And we're going to say if player dot character, then we want to make sure they've got a character loaded into the game. Then we're going to say they're going to get their humanoid root part, which is just a part in their player, which we can use to get the position. And we're going to say player dot character find first child humanoid root part. And we can say if humanoid root part, we're going to make sure they've got one and it's all loaded. Then what we can do is we can log their position. Their, their position in a table. So let's create a table here at the very top of our script. And I'm going to call it saved player positions like this. And it's just going to be an empty table. But this is where we're going to be logging all player positions when there is a red light. So we can later check their movements. So if we go back down here, we can say saved player positions and we can create an entry in this table for that player. So in square brackets, I'm going to put player, and that creates their own key in this table. And we can assign a value to that key, and that value is going to be their humanoid root part position. Okay? So we have logged the position of every single player that is playing the game. And now we just need to call that function from down here. So what we're going to do is we're going to say log player positions and we're going to pass the table called players in round so we have now logged the positions of everybody in the game so up here we can get those positions that we just logged and we can check if they've moved since then so let's go back up here and let's say let's loop through all of those saved player positions now since this is a dictionary and it has a key and a value we can utilize that first variable in the for loop. So let's say for player, because we stored their player object as the key, and the value was their saved position. So for player, comma, saved position in pairs, saved player positions, do, we'll say if player dot character, to make sure they're still here, their character is loaded, etc. We will say local humanoid root part equals player dot character, colon find first child humanoid root part. So we're doing the same as we just did before, getting their position. Let's check if their humanoid root part is here. And now what we can do is we can compare their current position with that save position, and we can get the distance between the two. So if the distance is more than one stood, then we'll kill them, since it's obvious that they've moved. Otherwise, we won't kill them. So let's say, in brackets, if humanoid root part dot position minus saved position, because that's the value stored in this table. You see here, we store it as the value, and this is the key. So if the save position, sorry, humanoid root part position minus save position dot magnitude, 
this is the distance between this is the distance between the two positions is greater than or equal to one then we're going to kill the player so we're going to say player dot character colon break joints this is just a super quick and easy way to kill the player and now what we want to do is we want to remove them from that saved player positions table because they're now out of the round so saved player positions we'll use the key of the player object and we'll set it to nil so we're going to set this to nil because we no longer need to check if they have moved since they're out and finally we will remove the player from the round table so we will say local player index equals table dot find we're going to look in the players in round table for our player and we're going to get their index their position in the table so if player index then table dot remove we're going to remove them from the players in round table and we're going to pass their player index like that okay so now that we have uh, basically checked the position of every single player in the game we have now made a way to eliminate players they should be killed if uh, they are moving in a red light zone now the next thing we need to do is we need to reset the last spin so if the time is ready for us to turn it again five seconds has gone by then we need to set the last spin variable to the current time so that we can keep checking to see if five seconds has gone by so we're basically setting this as our base baseline it's like our benchmark to see how much time has gone by so this this if statement will only be satisfied again in five seconds time because we just reset the last spin variable to be the current time and since we're comparing the times here five seconds has to have gone by since the last spin and so last spin gets updated to the current time so we now need to wait five more seconds for the next spin but like i said we don't want to wait five seconds every time we want that element of chance of not knowing when the head is going to turn so we can say spin delay equals spin delay times 0.9 and that will just make it spin 10 percent faster each time because what it's doing is it's removing it's decreasing the spin delay by 10 percent so you're waiting less each time for the head to turn so now that we've done that let's just do some checks to make sure the round can still can still keep going because for example all players might be out so let's say if hashtag players in round equals equals zero then we obviously want the round to end because all players have died so we can say break and that will break out of this for loop here because we're still within this for loop which is controlling the game so we want to break out of that loop if all players have died and then the final thing we need in this for loop is a, a wait because otherwise it would just count down from zero, 60 to zero instantly we would need to have some kind of delay so that we can actually notice the changes each time it loops so let's say task dot wait and put a one in there but this is really important make sure you add a task wait okay otherwise you won't notice the game working you need to have this for a delay and then outside of this for loop okay you can see i can close it here there we go you don't want to have those red things by the way so you just click there to get rid of them you don't want those they're break points but we don't need them so outside of this for loop when the time is up or the players have died or whatever the game will be over by this point so by this point by this point the game is over so firstly we want to disconnect this event for the end touch because we no longer need it until the next round so let's just say end touch colon disconnect and this will prevent the barrier from working until next time okay it's just a simple way to avoid a memory leak so our game stays optimized and next let's reward our winners so you might have leader stats in your game or you want to reward the players somehow so i'm going to show you how to do that so we say for underscore comma winner in pairs i'm going to loop through the winners table that we created and we actually uh, did put the players into the winners table if they touched the end barrier so the winner is basically the player object of anyone who got to the end so you could do if winner dot character then maybe you want to apply some effect to their character okay you could do that in there or you might want to give them some money where you could do that 
by saying winner.leaderstats.money.value if you've got some leader stats set up. If you haven't got leader stats or anything set up, then don't do this. I'm not going to do this um, for now. I'm actually just going to comment all of these lines by selecting them and clicking toggle comment because I have nothing to give to a winner. Uh, but maybe that's something we can do in a future video, maybe. But then I'm just going to print round over like this. And then what will happen is it will, that's our function done. And then it will loop over again. It will wait five seconds and it will start the game again. So I'm just going to print at the top of this while loop, waiting five seconds before starting a new game. And then it will do this start game function all over again. Now we're nearly done. We just got one more thing to do. We need to make our GUI. Uh, our client UI actually show red light or green light because we've got this light status text label but it's got no text in it so we want to make it so that when there's a green light it shows green light when there's a red light it will say red light so how do we do this well I'm going to insert a local script into the client UI here and I'm going to call this control but you can call it whatever you want now inside this local script we're going to say local players equals game colon get service players and then we're going to say the same thing but for replicated storage because we need to get that is red light value out of the replicated storage and then we're going to say local label equals script dot parent dot light status that's the text that will appear on the screen the text label and then we can just check to see when that is red light value which we change in our service script. We want to check when that changes. So we can say replicated storage dot is red light dot changed curl on connect function. And then we're going to have a uh, an argument which will tell us whether it went red or not. So we can just call that is red light. And this is red light is going to be it's going to be true or false. So if it's true, we can just say if is red light here, if is red light then, so we know it's true, we can say label.text equals red light. And we can set the label text color three to be completely red. So color three dot from RGB two five five comma zero comma zero. And that will be the red color. Else is going to be false. And then we know that it's a green light. So we can say label.text equals green light. And we can say label.text color three equals color three dot from RGB zero comma two five five comma zero and that will make the text color three green and what this will do is whenever it notices that the is red light is changed and we change it from our server script here we're changing it right here then it will update the GUI okay so before we go ahead and test I'm going to change a couple of things now the timer does say three minutes to begin with what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my time label here. I'm just going to set the text to be nothing for now. So it only appears when the game starts. One other thing I noticed is that my bacon hair, uh, the head will move, but the hair won't move with it. So how do we fix that? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the pal hair handle. I'm just going to put it into the doll. So I'm removing that pal hair head accessory. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my head I'm going to insert a weld constraint. Okay. I'm also going to unanchor my handle. So my head. Sorry. The, the handle is the hair. Okay. So I'm going to unanchor it. Then in the weld constraint, I'm going to set the part one to be the head and the part zero to be the handle. And that should connect them so that when the head moves, the hair moves with it. Okay. So let's go ahead and test this thing out. I'm going to take the spawn location as well. That's from my base plate. You see this base plate here? You can delete that if you want. You can delete the base plate of the game. And I'm going to take the spawn location and I'm going to press move. I'm going to press F to go to where it currently is located. I'm going to move it all the way over here. Uh, in fact, let's see if we have any spawn locations. Okay, we don't. So I'm going to take the spawn location. I'm going to drag it above here. I'm just going to make it so that it covers the entire width of the base like this just so that we have a good place for people to spawn in. And then I'm going to set the transparency to one. I'm going to scroll down and set can collide to false. 
make sure it's anchored and I'm going to select the decal inside of it and remove it. So it basically is becoming invisible. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, basically go and try the game. Let's see if it works. So like I said, if you're using a Squid Game doll, that's fine. You probably won't have to do the changes I did there. Uh, you just want to make sure that everything's anchored though. And if you have any extra hair or things on top, that you weld them to the head using a weld constraint. Okay, let's go ahead and test this out. No idea if this will work or not. Uh, let's click on view and open up the output here. And let's click on home and let's click on play. So everything looks good so far. It's waiting five seconds before starting a new game. I'll make this a little bit bigger here. And we've got 57 seconds on the clock. We've got a red light and there you go. My noob is moving its head. So if I try to move, oof, I got killed. And you can see I ragdoll. That's because that ragdoll script, which came with the kit. We're not going to go into specifics on how that works because it's fairly advanced. And this tutorial would probably go on for hours if I explained it. Uh, but it's just a nicer way to die. Well, I say nicer, I mean you're dying. Is it nice or not? But it's just better than, boom, there we go. It's better than just your body parts going everywhere. Um, so let's see. There you go. The round restarted. You've got to be very quick. Uh, oh, oh, you can see there, we've got a bug, we've got a bug, I'll explain it in a minute. But you can see, when the round started, he was facing us. And it didn't say red light. Let's see if it, let's, let's just try and complete the game first. Oh, oh, I also died. Oh, we've got a couple of bugs here. Let's try and fix these bugs. I'm sure we'll fix them, but let, let's try and work out what the bugs are. So, the bug is, that he turns his head towards the wall when the game starts. And then when it's a red light, we get killed. So let's go and work out why these bugs are happening. So the first bug is that we didn't reset the player's head from the previous round. So to do this, let's just go into our start game function. And let's say green light head colon play. So it makes them face the wall again. Then we can set is red light to be false like this. And that should fix, it might fix the second problem as well. I'm not sure, but we'll see. And then we need to change the saved player positions to be an empty table again. Otherwise, it's going to use our saved position from last time. And I think this is what is causing the second bug. So we might have just killed two birds with one stone, knocked out two bugs in one uh, in one test. So let's click on play again and test it out. So, you know, you get bugs in everything. Even I get bugs. But if, you're, if you just have a quick look through your code and work out what's going wrong, you can see there, that um, he was facing the wall, that the, the character was facing the wall as soon as the game started. And you can see when it goes to red light, oh, we got killed again. Let's, 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 we'll go back and try and fix the, the second bug then here. Okay, so I've done a bit of debugging and I'm pretty sure I've worked out why this bug is happening. So I think it's because we're logging the player's position um, without waiting, we need to wait before we log. We need to wait until the player's head has spun around before we log the position. Otherwise, they're just going to get killed instantly. We need to give them a little bit of time for the head to spin before we actually say, uh, before we actually start killing players. Just give them that time to stop. So if we say red light head dot completed colon wait with a pair of brackets on the end, that is going to wait there until the spin has finished, until the head has turned around, so that we are only logging the positions once that they are frozen, or once they've stopped moving. And then, if they move again, we'll be able to tell how far they've moved. So let's click on play again and work and see if this is working. So we're going to get put into our outfit and the timer starts and we're counting down, counting down, red light. Ooh, turn around, bacon boy. Do, 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 do. Oh, red light. Nope, oh, we didn't move. Nobody moved. And green light. Do, 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 do. Green light. Do, 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 do. Hey, we got to the end. Okay, so we are at the end. And you can see it says round over. So we won. So I think everything is working here. 
very, very good. And just to show you, if you did want to give the player some cash, then let's create another script. I'm just going to speed run through this. So I'll come back to you when I have a leaderboard. Okay, so we just created a leader stat script. So if I play the game, you will see that in the right corner over here, I've got a leaderboard with cash. So I wanted to give some cash to all the winners. What we could say is in our server script, we can untoggle the comments over here and we can say winner.leaderstats.cash.value plus equals five, for example. And then if you win, you will get plus five cash. So I'm going to be a bit cheeky here. I'm going to go into the server. I'm going to go into my player. I'm going to go into my humanoid. I'm going to set my walk speed to be 150. Okay, and when it's when it goes to the next green light, when it goes to the next red light, I'm going to stop. And I'm just going to speed run my way to the end here. When it's a green light. Okay, here we go. Ready? Watch my cash. Okay, the round ended. And, oh, I've got 90 cash. 90 cash. Okay, okay. That is because we don't have a debounce on this toucher. So my character has probably touched this 10 times. So it's added loads of cash to my to my uh, character because I'm in the winner's table lots of times. So to prevent this, we can just say uh, local uh, in winner's table. No, we will say winner's index equals table dot find winners and we'll say touch player and then let's just say if uh, not winners index uh, then return end okay and that should prevent us from entering the winners table more than once so let's go ahead and try it out once more so I've purposely left in the debugging um, to an extent in here so you can see how debugging works in a Roblox game because it's an important skill to have. So let's set the walk speed to 190. Wait for the green light. And let's speed run our way to the end here. Let's see if that worked. Oh, I don't think it registered us touching the the detector here. Let's try again. Hmm. Doesn't want to doesn't want me to touch the detector for some reason. Come on. There we go. I don't know why that's not working. Ah, my bad. We want it to be if winners index, not if not. Because if you're already in the table, then we don't want to add you again. But if you're not in the table, then sure, go ahead, we'll add you. So let's try this one more time. I promise. This will be the last time. Hopefully. Right, we'll go back in. Workspace, Alvin Blocks and humanoid and 200 walk speed and we'll speed run our way to the end here do, 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 do. wait for the red light there we go we got our five cash so there we go we only added ourselves to the winner's table once so we got five cash and then we have another round here and our walk speed got reset now there's one small thing i wanted to point out at the end of the video and that is that during the game the head uh, which we coded to reduce the delay every single time. You can see the head in my game here is moving back and forth really quickly. So we go green light, red light, green light, red light, really, really fast. And that's because since it's uh, decreasing the delay between turning the head by 10% each time, eventually the delay is going to be really small. So there might only be half a second delay. So if you want to change this, then what you can do is you can edit the number which we multiply that spin delay by and I'll show you how to do that now just so that the head doesn't keep turning back and forth really quickly. So I'm going to change mine to 0 0.95 and it's over here in the server script where we say spin delay equals spin delay times 0 0.95. If you make the number bigger then that's going to decrease the amount which it's it goes down by each time. So if it's 0.95, then instead of going down by 10%, it's going down by 5%, okay? So just increase that number between 0 and 1, some number between that, and that should fix it. And don't forget, you can also change the round duration seconds. So make sure that you've got a, a decent number, which 
won't make the head spin back and forth really quickly, uh, which is which works with your round duration. Because if you had a round duration of five minutes, then obviously you'll need to increase this number here. Otherwise, it's going to spin uh, back and forth really quickly at some point because it's constantly decreasing by 5%. Now, one final thing, if you don't want the players to die uh, once they've reached the end, so when they move, you know, we don't want to kill them, what you can do is if we go into the server script and in this part here where we have the round loop and we're checking the saved positions, let's firstly check to see if each player is in the winner's table. So we can say local winner index equals table.find winners and we can put the player in here. And then what we can do is we can say if winner index, then continue. And what this will do is it will just move on to the next player in the for loop because we don't want to carry on with this person. We just want to continue to the next loop. So it's going to stop here and just move to the next player because we don't want to kill the player if they're already a winner. So let me go and show you this in action. And don't forget as well, you can change the original starter spin delay at the top of the function here. Okay, here we go. Oh, I died straight away. <laughs> Got a couple of people reaching it. And would you look at that? They're not dying because they are a winner. And I'll just prove it as well. When we get to the end here. Ooh. Hey, we are a winner. Okay, so there you go. That proves it then. If you beat the course, you no longer will die. But there you go. That is how you create a squid game on Roblox. So if you enjoyed this tutorial, please do leave a like. Please do subscribe to the channel if you're new and turn on your notifications so you never miss an episode. And don't forget, if you want to get access to this project with the full code, everything, um, then you can become a channel member, a premium channel member for $4.99 by clicking on the join button underneath the video next to the subscribe button. There'll also be a link in the description. You get all sorts of cool perks, uh, including the source code, as I said, and like I said, we might do more episodes on this in the future, so let me know what you'd like to see. And don't forget, you can get the kit and all information you need will be listed in the description. So thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.